Hello my friends, welcome back to my channel. Hello, welcome back. I'm so glad you are here. I have a weekly reading update for you, recent reads. Let's talk about everything that I read last week and uh, yeah, let's get into it. Before we do that, I do have a big announcement that I wanted to make that I am actually really, really excited about, something I've been wanting to do for a long time and I've just kind of been real hesitant to bite the bullet because you know, it's a big commitment, but I really, really want to develop and foster a closer community of people who just really get me and, you know, the things I have to say and want to connect with me personally. So I started a Patreon for Crystal's Bookish Life. I'm very excited about this. I have three different tiers, three different levels. Each of them gain a little bit more access to me in terms of talking with me, connecting with me, doing live sprint, stream sprints and things like that. I am super duper excited about this. I have a intro video up on Patreon, which I will link, link my Patreon down below. You can go and watch that and see if you're interested in that. There's a tip jar tier. There is a, a little bit higher tier above that where you do get to have some, you know, connection with me. We'll talk, you'll get priority response to comments and you'll get to vote on books for me to read in my weekly reading vlogs. And then the last tier is one where you really get to connect with me personally through exclusive live streams, like reading sprints and things like that. I'm gonna be reading and reviewing a book that you vote specifically, and that will be an exclusive in-depth review just for you at that tier. It will live forever on Patreon. Um, there will also be opportunities to buddy read. And the big one is a Discord, which I have never done on my channel before. So you can join that and we can be in there chatting as often as you would like. So. I hope that uh, you check it out if you want to. I'm super excited about it and I can't wait to get to know all of you better. And with all that being said, I do want to say that I'm still going to 100% continue my content here as it has been. I'm not going to be moving my reading vlogs. I'm still going to be doing weekly reading vlogs. If I am vlogging, they will be here, weekly reading vlogs for sure. I will be doing some exclusive reading vlogs on Patreon, but they will be different than the weekly reading vlog here. They will be, you know, more personal, more, more, I will definitely probably have more things to say there than I am able to hear just publicly. I will, you know, maybe talk about deeper issues, things that are a little bit controversial maybe, or just chit chat things about my personal life, talking to get team to know you. So that's what's going to be on Patreon, exclusive videos, exclusive reviews. The weekly vlogs aren't going away. They're going to be staying here as often as I am able to vlog for you here. And uh, yeah, so content here on the channel is not going to change. I will be getting more exclusive videos that are kind of more personal, a more in-depth look at how I break books down and how I review them and things like, like that. But recommendation videos, vlogs, vlogmas, things like that, it's not going away here. And uh, while I will be doing reading sprints more often on Patreon, I still want to continue to have them here as well even though I haven't really done a great job of being consistent with that. So anyway, thank you for listening to me and uh, I am very excited about this and I hope, hope that you stop by, check it out. And if you wanna join, I would love to have you there and I would love to get to know you a little bit better. So, all right, let's talk about the books that I read. So one of the main reasons that I didn't vlog last week, I was super busy with work and family stuff, but one of the main reasons I did not vlog is because I was reading Rhythm of, no, I was reading Words of Radiance by Brandon Sanderson. So this is almost 1300 pages. Maybe it is, it's, yeah, it's 1300 pages. And I just read The Way of Kings in June. I read The Way of Kings, absolutely loved and adored it with my whole heart. That was a six star read for me. And I just wanted to get back into this world and get back into these characters. So for a while I was reading this alongside some other things, you know, because this is such a long book. It's such a commitment. and. I kind of like to feel like I'm accomplishing things by finishing books a little quicker, you know? <laughs> but I uh, I got to a point last week where I was like, I just wanted a comfort read. I wanted something comforting and enjoyable. And I knew that this was going to deliver because I love these characters. I love the world. I'm very well acquainted with it. It wasn't anything I was going to have to really expend a lot of brain power to focus on because I already know how the world is set up. I already know where the plot threads are going. I can just go along for a wonderful storytelling adventure. And that's exactly what this book delivered. So my whole week was spent just reading this book and I adored it. I gave it five stars. This is not quite a six star book for me. I think there were some specific things about how Brandon wrote his characters in The Way of Kings that really resonated with me. And I think part of that is how he outlined the trauma that they had gone through that kind of put them on the path of where they were in that book. 
and then where they ended up. And this book feels like, you know, obviously it's a continuation of that and they're kind of on a journey. They're kind of getting to know one another a little bit better, but we don't have that rawness that really shaped who they were. And that's something that always just really resonates with me in books is seeing what makes a character who they are specifically in this moment. So I really loved The Way of Kings. I still really enjoyed this. I gave it five stars. Obviously I loved it. I just think the fantasy world in here is so well built. I just love the characters so much. I love the way he tells a story. Every time I have read a Brandon Sanderson book, there has been something that people call the Sander Lanch at the end, where just like all of the plot threads just kind of like careen down the hill all at the same time to end up where they eventually end up. And it's kind of a little crazy and wonderful. And that happened here at such a level that I was not quite prepared for it. Like it was extreme and I really loved it. But again, because I'm such a huge character driven reader and there wasn't quite the character change or dynamic in the characters in this book as they were in the first book. So it's still like five star, great, absolutely fantastic epic fantasy series. And despite the length, I feel like this is so easily digestible. The writing is very approachable. The characters are, I mean, the magic is very easy to understand. So I think if, if you've kind of been feeling like maybe this is a little intimidating because it's so big, it is big, but there's nothing about this that feels unapproachable. This is very easily digestible, high fantasy, fabulous magic system, like everything about it. This was wonderful. So yeah, it, we're basically following three different characters at a time of war. In the beginning of the book, one of them, Kaladin, is a warrior and he's sort of banding together this group of misfits to get them out of the dregs where they're at. He was one time a very well-acclaimed, well-lauded warrior and then something happens to cause a lot of turmoil with him, a lot of trauma, and he kind of falls from grace and then he kind of has to work his way back up. And then we have Dalinar, who is a bit of a general and a bit of a legend. He is a warrior but something is happening with him that he doesn't really know how to control or what it is and that is affecting how other people perceive him and so he kind of gets down on the ladder and people kind of start to see that he is maybe a little bit dangerous so we have his storyline and then we have Shalan who is this young woman who is a little bit feisty and she is uh, under duress to try and find some funds to save her family from financial ruin after the death of her father and so she goes to basically apprentice with this other woman who's going to teach her and keep her as a scholar and there's some subterfuge that's going to happen there. So I'm basically giving you the gist of what's happening in book one. None of that, that's already happened in book one and that's where they begin, right? Their story begins. So anything that I tell you that happens in this book is gonna be a spoiler. So that's just the overall thing that's happening. There's a lot of political intrigue, but it's not too political. Like it's not something that feels like there are so many court politics happening that it's hard to kind of wrap your head around. There is obviously war, warring kingdoms, warring, uh, groups of people. There's this mysterious element of storms and uh, magic that is involved there and it's just fantastic. I loved it. I loved it so much. So really adored this one. Five stars. Okay so now the next book that I read is The Sorceress Comes to Call by T. Kingfisher. So this book will release August 6th. I love and adore T. Kingfisher. I've talked about her a lot on my channel. She has such a way of writing that is unlike anything that I've ever read before. Her books feel, for the most part, like she does write in a couple of different genres. She does some fantasy, she does some cozy stuff, but I think what she's most known for is her way of blending horror with some cozy feeling vibes. And I think that I've heard her explain it herself as cozy horror, and that is very, very fitting. So this book is is based on the grim fairy tale, The Goose Girl. So many years ago, <laughs> Um, many, I don't know how many years ago, but Shannon Hale came out with a book called The Goose Girl, which was her retelling of that grim fairy tale. And it was very popular and I've read that multiple times and I love that book so much. I've actually been wanting to reread it for the last few years. So I was, that was my introduction to The Goose Girl fairy tale. And I was really kind of fell in love with that fairy tale, even though it is tragic in a very specific way that if you know me, you know why I feel like it's tragic. But I was really interested to see what T. Kingfisher would do, especially since I read What Moves the Dead, which is her Edgar Allan Poe, The House of Usher retelling, which I thought was magnificent, magnificently done. So I wasn't quite sure how she was going to take this. Was she going to take it more in the terms of Edelin Bone, which is more cozy fantasy with some elements of horror? Was she going to go more in the direction of like a house with good bones 
or What Moves the Dead, which I feel like hedges on like creepy atmospheric horror, you know, with some cozy elements too. And I feel like she settles very firmly into this very dark, foreboding, fairy tale type of feel, where she also is adding some of these cozy elements through interactions with our main character and her horse, her family's horse, Ferrata and just some of the way that the the whole scenes are described, some quiet moments that we have with other characters. So something I think T. Kingfisher does exceptionally well, which makes her horror books very approachable, is how she can create these scenes that that really capture the feeling of horror. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bloody and gory, although there is some of that in here as well. But I think what that means is she has captured this idea of horror, where this idea is so unsettling that even thinking about it like makes you afraid, makes you feel that dread, that anxiety, that, that horrifying feeling. She gets you to feel that so well, and then at the same time, she'll like pull you back just a little bit and put you in a little cozy place. So, and I think that's really effective for her type of storytelling because not only is she telling you a story to entertain you in this way and to create these feelings, but she's also largely telling a story of ideas. And the main idea here, I think, is consent and autonomy, personal autonomy, and having being able to make your own choices in, whether that's in a toxic relationship, an abusive relationship, or whatever it is, that ability to have consent to make your own choices, to have that taken away, to have your own personal autonomy, I think is explored really, really well here. So we basically have our main character, she's 14 years old in this book when it begins, and she is under complete control of her mother, who is a sorceress. And to the point where she cannot close doors in her house, she cannot move if her mother commands her like not to move, she is unable to make basically any of her own choices. There's a scene in this book that I thought was particularly chilling, where the mother leaves and leaves the daughter home alone for maybe like the first time. And for the first time, the daughter can move on her own and she chooses to close her bedroom door and she just like stands there against it, feeling the door closed. And I thought that was such a powerfully emotive scene where it was just such a simple thing of closing the door and how that might feel if even that choice was taken away from you. Ah, <sighs> it was so, so good. So anyway, the mom is, you know, a sorceress. She's doing all of these things that are not great. She's taking everyone's autonomy. She wants to be in control. She's trying to shape her own life. And there's a death in the town and they end up going to this other area where she's hoping to marry a rich and wealthy man while at the same time marrying off her daughter to another rich and wealthy man so that they will be set. They will be secured. Their life will be made for them, right? And that is where we have another female character come in. I believe this is the Duke's sister. And she recognizes what is happening with our young heroine, the daughter. What's happening with her? What is going on? There's something going on with the mother. And then we have a series of events that end up being deeply unsettling and deeply creepy, but also deeply moving. And I just thought that this was masterfully done. I, you know, I can't think of any book that I have read by T. Kingfisher where I've been disappointed. I feel like I've given all of her books five stars, maybe I've given one four stars, but her gift for storytelling is unmatched. The way that she's able to create emotions that get you to feel very specifically what is happening on the page at this time is fantastic. So I, you know, I haven't really read an arc that I felt this moved by in a really long time. I mean, granted, I haven't really read a lot of arcs this year, but this one was fantastic and I would highly recommend this. I mean, this is an author that you simply have to try. There's there's something for everyone in her writing style and this was fantastic. So this comes out August 6th. Special thank you to Tor Books and NetGalley for the arc. I absolutely loved it and I gave this book five stars and I highly recommend it. Okay, so now a little bit about the books that I'm currently reading. So I started Dune, believe it or not. I just recently, a few months ago, watched the movies. Really, really loved them for the first time. I didn't see them before that. And, you know, this is a book that I've heard a lot of mixed things about where people feel like it's either too difficult to understand or it's too slow or it's not engaging enough. And, you know, I kind of, anytime that I feel like there's a good amount of buzz in that way about a book, specifically about how the story is told, especially if I've consumed the story itself in a different format and I've been engaged with it, like I wanna go and read the source material. So that's what I'm doing with this one. I'm not too far into it right now, but I will say that I am very intrigued with the writing style. I don't find it difficult to get into at all. I don't feel like the world is hard to understand at all, but I do think the writing style is interesting in the way that I think he's very, very specific with the word choices that he's using in a way that feels 
beautiful but also spare and also a little bit like masculine like I deeply really enjoy this writing style that at times can feel very utilitarian which I think is very fitting of a sci-fi book but at other times it almost gets to a little bit flowery sometimes and I just like his word choice which seems unusual but also very fitting for the for the page for that line and that's something that I actually really love and admire about an author which you know, so this is a book I'm currently reading. And with that last remark about word choice, let's talk about the book that I'm not sure if I'm going to continue reading or DNF because I just feel very, very conflicted about this book. Okay. <laughs> like I feel super, super conflicted. All right. So, so I started reading Quicksilver by Callie Hart because I heard everybody talking about it, everybody raving about this fantasy romance. And I was like, I want to know, I want to know what they're talking about. I want to, I want to really love this book too. You know how I get, you know how I get when I see a, a book in a genre that I love. I love fantasy romance. And I'm just like, I want to experience that too. So I will say that I have read this author before. I've read her books before and I haven't, I haven't read a complete book from her. I've read her writing before. I picked up, I think, Requiem. It was going around. People were talking a lot about it. And I really struggled with the writing style, like big time. I just didn't feel like it was written in a way that resonated with me. And the thing I remember most about that is her word choice seemed awkward. I didn't like how she phrased her sentences. It seemed awkward. It felt like too much work and not in a way that was like using my brain in a good way. It felt like muddling through mud to get to the story, you know, whereas I feel like when you're reading a book like this, which does require some work to kind of really dissect the words that he's using, why did he use that word here? What's the importance of that? What does that have to say about the character? Like, that's the type of work that I really, really enjoy, you know, when it comes to reading. And also, like, it's very different, the writing here. This is a much more simplistic writing style, which allows you to just get into the story, which I love. But I deeply love a book where I have, can just, like, parse apart the words and think about what does this word mean? Why did this author put this word here? There's a deliberate reason why. Why did he do that? You know, I love that. So that's the type of work that I love when it comes to a writing style. But I will say this book, the word choices, Quicksilver. The word choice is, <sighs> it's frustrating me. So the basic premise of this is it's a fey fantasy romance. And we have a concept of Quicksilver, which is basically that some people, some fae, have an ability to make metal. I'm not entirely sure what metal yet. I'm 30% into this book, by the way. I'm not sure what metal it is, if it is always silver, if it's only silver, but it kind of, there's some type of connection with this fae who has this bloodline and the silver where they can kind of like give it its own entity, its own life in a way. And then it kind of has a mind of its own and it melts, turns into these little puddles and pools. And sometimes it goes and attacks people. And sometimes it creates like this portal where a fae can come through. And you know, that portal has been like closed for lots and lots of years. So our heroine begins the story. She works in a forge and her parents are long gone. And she has a brother who she loves and is kind of like work looking after. And uh, she ends up caught by this guard in her town. It feels a little Hunger Games-y dystopian in the beginning where there are like different districts and she lives in a very poor district where they're, even the use of their water is very, very managed, like micromanaged. They don't get to have full access to water and things like that. So she lives in a very poor area and she's kind of scraping by. She's constantly thirsty. She doesn't know how she's going to provide for her brother. So she feels very desperate. So she gets caught by this guard and she sees an opportunity for herself to take his gauntlet, basically. I think his wrist gauntlet or something like that. And she steals it, basically. And because, you know, she steals it with the intention of I can melt this down, I can get some money and then we can, you know, have some food and water and survive. Now, she ends up doing that and things happen where she ends up getting caught later on with the armor and they decide they're going to put her to death through some of the actions that she did and some of the things that she said. So she's going to be put to death. And that moment where she's almost getting put to death is when we see the Quicksilver come up and this pool emerge and the metal is kind of doing things on its own and it's implied that it's through her own power that's happening. And then our love interest comes up through the Quicksilver pool, saves her and takes her down to the Fey Land. So our love interest is, you know, a dark haired brooding man. He's thousands of years old as a Fey is. And he's honestly pretty, he's pretty great. Not gonna lie. I, I do have a weakness for thousand year old, broody, dark haired, 
you know, kind of jerky guys. Like, his attitude is very reminiscent of uh, a Jennifer L. Armentrout type of book where he's snarky, there's a lot of banter, a lot of it is very, like, sexually charged banter between the two of them. So obviously, you know, it's enemies to lovers, they have an attraction thing type going on. But uh, that also is kind of not working for me, because if you're gonna make a creature, a being, a, a, a male lead, be thousands of years old, and he sounds like he's an 18-year-old, I don't love that. I don't love that, personally. I don't love that. Like, I feel like he needs to have a little bit of gravity and a little bit of maturity, especially because his whole persona is very created to be very dangerous, to be very, you know, kind of um, edgy and, like, don't mess with him. Like, he's, he's danger. He's danger. So it, when he's introduced, people are, like, scared of him, like he's danger. And then he's, like, cracking jokes with her the whole time, and it just, the vibe doesn't seem to fit, you know? But I will say, I still like him. I do. I, I still like him. I do. So now to the writing style. This is not insurmountable for me because I am so intrigued with why is this so popular? And I am, I am intrigued with him as a hero and this whole story overall. Like I want to know what is the deal with Quicksilver because, you know, it's interesting to pair the idea of metals with Faye when Faye typically, you know, are allergic to iron. Like that's their one weakness. So I'm kind of curious, like what is, what is, why would you choose to have a fey with alchemy? That sort of seems like a weird dichotomy traditionally in the lore of fey. So I don't know. That's interesting. But I'm gonna I'm gonna read a few of these um, if I can find them. I'm gonna read to you a few of the phrasings in here and why I'm saying like it feels awkward and it feels awkward, but also her word choice is wrong. So you know I've heard a lot about indie authors. You know don't be harsh on them for editing and things like that. But I mean like. If a book is published and I am paying for it and it is edited poorly, and I'm not talking about like commas and periods and run-on sentences necessarily, I'm I'm not talking about like structural things. I'm literally talking about this has not been edited to a level I would expect of a published book that is earning money, and specifically because words are used incorrectly here, right? So here we go. One of the words that is used incorrectly is a look of indigence. Indigence stole across Everlane's pretty features. Excuse me, but the Fey are not diseased, right? Clearly she means indignance. Indignance. But she chose to use indigence, you know, which basically means a state of extreme poverty. So a look of extreme poverty stole across? Like, you know what I mean? Like that's a word, that's a word choice that is incorrect, okay? So another one that I found for like an incorrect word choice is rye. R-Y-E she had in here. And uh, the sentence says, a look of wry amusement on his irritatingly handsome face. She means wry, W-R-Y. Now, am I being nitpicky or am I just sort of like, it changes things. If you don't know what the word means, or even if it's a mistake, like wry, that's probably a mistake, right? But it should have been caught. It should have been caught. And, and that to me is frustrating. And that will never be a five-star book because one, you need to understand the words that you're using if you're writing a story, if you're writing a book. And two, that should have been right, that should have been caught, right? But there are other things in here that sort of feel like um, like a weird description, like in this, this scene, it says, a wave of heat swept over me, making my mouth sweat. I don't love that. I don't love the visual. I don't believe your mouth sweats. I don't believe it, you know? It, it doesn't, it doesn't sweat. Your mouth doesn't sweat, okay? Now, one last one, okay? So this is not necessarily about, it is kind of about phrasing, okay? She's talking about the hero, the main love interest. His name is Kingfisher, Kingfisher and she's used his name to describe him. Kingfisher came into the room. Fisher came into the room. He, he, right? It's just her and him. They're the only ones in this room, in this scene. She chooses to describe him as Lane's dark-haired brother smirked like a demon when he realized why would you do that why why would you do that why would you why would you describe him as lane's dark-haired brother lane is a character we've met before but when it's just the two of them in the room why would you say lane's dark-haired brother and either a and either not say his name a or b just say him he there's no other guy in there okay i know i'm being picky all right but See, this is why I wanted to give you all an example, because I feel like a lot of times when I am critical of writing, I haven't given examples, and I don't know if any of you care, like maybe you do, but it's things like that 
that really drag a book down and make me want to stop reading. And honestly, I, I may DNF this, I don't know. And I know some of you are going to say just go ahead and DNF it, but my curiosity about why this book is so popular remains. And I have a feeling it's going to have to do with spice. <laughs> and if that's the case, I'm going to be deeply disappointed because a book that is getting this much rave reviews, it's got to have something else. And at this point, I don't necessarily feel like their chemistry is great. I don't feel like there's any emotional connection. We're still very much in the enemies. I hate you, but I also kind of want to bang you area. But also the concept of the world is a little wonky to me. So I really, I really am mostly curious about why did this author choose to have they who have power over metal, when iron, historically, in the lore, in all lore, you know, and maybe she's making her own up, but it seems like, why would you necessarily go against that? Why would you have metal powers be something when Fey, their one weakness is typically iron? You know, because she's also established in this world that the Fey do abide by the rule that they cannot lie. So those are like the two main things with Fey. They cannot lie, and iron is a weakness. So... I'm curious where it's going. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know, man. I'm gonna just keep reading it until... Because, like, and I know what I have to justify. And I I do enjoy picking books apart like this, but I also, I just really want to like it. I just do. Because I just, I could, I can get on board with him as a hero. I could. And, uh, I don't know what else. Anyway, so yeah, those are the books that I'm currently... Th those are the books that I read slash am currently reading. And uh, that's all I have to say. So <laughs> thank you so much, my friends, for watching this video. I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed my rambling. I'm grateful to have you here. And uh, one more plug just to go take a peek at the Patreon, see what you think, see if you want to join. And there is a seven day free trial I have activated if you want to come check in and see how it's going. And uh, yeah, if you have made it this far and you want to leave me an emoji to let me know that I was here, leave me something orange or yeah, orange. And I'll see y'all in my next video.